guys, I don't even know what part of the vlog we're doing this upload, but this particular vlog is gonna be just about, one of the things I always enjoyed coming down here is listening to the General Motors executives talk about the current marketplace, some things going on, production numbers, that kind of stuff, and there's even an introduction of two new colors today. This is the GM Seminar from Harlan Charles and Taj. So take a moment, watch the entire seminar. I didn't do, I guess, I, usually I stay for the question and answer thing at the end, but they seem to get dumber every year. So it's like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> so we're just, sorry. It, I mean, half you guys left if you were there. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, these are useless. They're not going to answer questions on future products. So this is the presentation from General Motors that they do every single year right here at the National Corvette Museum. If you haven't attended this event before, you need to. And I hope you enjoyed today's vlog. champs and uh, got off to uh, the start this year we got finally got our first win at Long Beach there we have in defense trying to three-peat for the uh, for the championship this year and the interesting thing as you know on the racing side we compete with a lot of the same cars we compete with in the showroom and the showroom once again we're also champions with over 40% of what we call the luxury sports car segment Corvette owns and that's thanks to all of you and all your friends buying Corvettes and we're just really uh, doing even even better in the showroom than on the racetrack believe it or not in, in beating the competition. Uh, one of the things uh, I'd like to go over, a lot of people like to see the data, one of the things just uh, with the carbon edition we did for 2018 that we showed here last year. Uh, we did all the 650 that, that we that we said we were going to do, and, and people snapped them up. It was It's a really special car, and it was a very successful uh, special edition uh, for 65 years of Corvette and all the carbon components, which uh, we celebrate. Now, um, here's how we're doing so far for 2019 model year. Already got some returns, you know, the first 7,000 cars ordered for 2019. And interesting, the Grand Sport, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, 30% Grand Sport Sound Pass Stingray is the most popular uh, Corvette model. Uh, you look at the different um, models, you know, the Stingray, the 1LT is, be is becoming popular, and this is uh, uh, really good for us as people, you know, they can get into a Corvette for not a lot of money. And, and, and what a great car, now we've upgraded the wheels, there's a lot of wheel options on the Stingray uh, with the 19s and 20s. On the Grand Sport, the 2LT is the most popular. Uh, historically, in the Z06, the 3LZ has been most popular. It's getting a little bit more 2 as the ZR1 comes out. And of course, the ZR1, um, we have just the two packages. And of course, the, uh, the Highline package is very popular. 
And just a few highlights, we have all this data on the different models. Um, one thing is the uh, eight-speed uh, paddle shift continues to keep going up around over 80%. The uh, wheels, again, we have all these wheel options available for the Stingray. The one that Doug Feehan was talking about, his new Stingray uh, that he just bought recently, oddly enough, the, one, the wheels that he got are the silver ones in the corner, and it didn't even show up to, so he's a pretty rare guy. You know, we got one that didn't even get to a full percent, but uh, if you want to be like Feehan, we could use people to buy those wheels, so you bought the Feehan wheels. On the, uh, the Grand Sport, again, the, uh, the Heritage Package with the stripes continues to be uh, pretty popular as well. Red brakes, black wheels are the most popular wheel color. I just sit through here too. Z06, uh, Z06 continues to do well. A lot of people are saying, well, isn't the Z01 going to hurt the Z06? Actually, uh, we saw this last time. A lot of people come in to see the Z01. And then you may decide, you know what, I can get a Z06 today and not have to wait, and it's a great car. So it actually helps the Z06 a little bit, still doing uh, very well with the Z06. Competition seats always do well for Z06. And then we even have some early ZR1 uh, stuff. Look, 69% uh, are getting the ZTK package with the high wing and the uh, uh, more aggressive chassis. We're gonna, we'll talk about that a little bit more. The other thing, incredibly, the ZLC, that's our car we have here right here the c-ring orange design package we'll talk about the details of that in a few minutes 37% uh, of the uh, zero ones people are checking the box for that package and so far the carbon flash wheels are the most uh, popular and again uh, close to 80% um, paddle shift 8-speed and here's the colors everybody's all excited about colors uh, Arctic white uh, every year the since actually every year since 2013 has been the most popular Corvette color. And black always does well towards red, gray is doing well. And then look at the orange. 12% uh, fifth place for, for orange, uh, Sebring orange. And we talked about a little bit, you know, how we come to the, the bash and the Corvette event. And you guys kept saying we want a bright orange. This gentleman with the orange shirt. <laughs> he bugged me for a while on it. So we finally got the bright orange. And he was right. Look how great it's doing. So let's get into uh, some new stuff for 2019. And for, you know, obviously the Super One is saying there's a couple other little changes, small but significant things. Uh, uh, and we said we actually, as Buzz said, we actually have been building 2019 cars since January 29th. Zero One started in March. Um, we brought back the, the engine build program for Zero One and Zero Six. So if you want to uh, build your own engine, it's a great, it's a great like fantasy camp type activity that's available. And the other thing, uh, uh, not insignificant, is the switch to over to zero W40 oil. And this is a, uh, a great move because um, now you, don't have, you can use that same oil for both street and track use. You don't have to do the, the oil change if you're gonna go to the track uh, on all the cars. It's good for both usages. It's also backwards compatible to 2014 Corvettes. And also forward, if you don't have a 040, you're not going to the track, you can still use the 530 as well, so you can go either way. But it's a great uh, achievement from uh, our friends at Mobile One to upgrade the uh, oil to be uh, dual purpose. So that's exciting. And there's some uh, accessory news, performance. A lot of people are asking for performance upgrades. We came up with this new, it's is available now. You can order it. Uh, um, as a dealer install option with your car or get it as an accessory. It's the new performance intake. First of all, it looks pretty cool. You got the J, we have the J on the, uh, on the air intake and things like that. But the key, the key things about it, with a ZR1, it adds 17 horsepower, makes it 772. And a uh, Z06 adds 11 horsepower, you know, gets you to 661. So it actually has a good performance uh, benefit. It's 50 state legal. It even comes with the label, uh, so it's a neat uh, performance. It, it comes with the warranty also, so it's a nice upgrade, especially for Z06 and uh, Z01s. Uh, and okay, uh, this is also a thing. This is something we also heard from uh, you guys coming to us. We, we always come every year and give a list of all the 
the details and improvements we do year to year. And the first thing people say, well, I just got a car. My car is one year old, two year old. What of these app upgrades can I add to my car? And nine out of 10 times we say, well, we're sorry, but you know, it's not backwards compatible with electronics, whatever, you have to get a new car. But this one, um, which is really cool, if you have magnetic ride control, we're actually making the newer calibrations uh, available so that you can upgrade. Anybody, anybody in here done this to upgrade it? You guys, and, and the few people I've talked to, everybody says it's a great upgrade, they notice it right away. And it's basically available on um, all the Corvettes with magnetic ride control. So the, the FE2 Stingray, the Z51, which have with magnet, if you have magnetic ride, the Grand Sports, Z06s. Um, they're, they're available in upgrades, and there's two different kits. Some of you can either get the full one, or some. Or we actually made one available that leaves the track mode alone. The reason we did that in case uh, somebody, people have liked the track mode the way that it is. They do, they've done made modifications. They don't want to touch the track mode. You can get it that way too, or you can get the new track mode calibration as well. So it's something to look into if you want to upgrade your magnetic ride. And another one we've done, we, we, we actually came out with these um, carbon flash rockers for the uh, 2017 Grand Sport and Z06, and they're now available if you have Stingray. It's a nice add to it's both arrow and then the main thing too is uh, reduces stone chips and things like that. And it's less expensive than getting the carbon fiber versions. So that's, that's available now too. <coughs> So let's talk about the Zero One. Now, as you know, this isn't the first time we've done a Corvette Zero One. Zero One has a great history and heritage for Corvette. And actually, the first Zero One uh, is one that maybe a lot of people may not remember or know about. Uh, actually, it started as a lot of the Corvette names start as an RPO code you know, for, a, for a performance package. This was very um, heavy duty package for an LT1 engine, uh, 1970 to 72 Corvettes. All those three years, only 53 were made. And uh, had you know, very, some hardcore stuff, no air conditioning, power windows, no st power steering, no radio. So it was really a hardcore track package. And it cost $1,010.50. So I could learn something from the, the guys back then. They used to use the cents. You know, that's more money than I'm leaving on the table. I should add 50 cents to every option. They were smart back then. But anyway. Of course, the 1990 Z01 um, really brought the Corvette into full supercar status. You know, with the LT5 engine, came out 375 horsepower, went up to 405. Uh, in 1990, it came out 58,995. It's a lot of money back then, but really it competed with cars that were more expensive. Had three wide tires, even by today's standards, 315. And we made almost 7,000 of those over its uh, basically six model year run that we had. Then, Zero One returned in 2009. It was the first supercharged Corvette, and uh, 638 horsepower and uh, first Corvette that cost over $100,000. Uh, and there's a lot of Corvette firsts in this car, and a lot of the things that we did on this car have translated to the, the models across the range. You know, the carbon fiber components, carbon fiber hood, carbon fiber roof, the carbon ceramic brakes from Brembo, the Michelin tires for the first, this is the first production Corvette, with the Michelin tires, we had the unique hood one now. 19s and 20s, first Corvette with 19 inch front, 20 inch rear, we thought that was so outrageous, now that's our standard size wheels on the Stingray. But, um, great car. And, headed off to the new 2019 Corvette Zero One, I'll attach, I'll tell you more about that. Tonight we celebrate 65 years of incredible performance. Nothing makes the heart beat faster than Corvette. Since the first generation launched in 1953, Corvette has symbolized sports car excellence. It's time for the return of another legendary Corvette name. This is the fastest, most powerful Corvette ever created. Introducing the 2019 Corvette VR. The new LT5 
have 6.2 liter supercharged V8, so this is an SAD certified 755 horsepower, 750 foot pounds of torque. The ZR1 will hit a top speed of 212 miles per hour. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce the fastest, most powerful Corvette in the world. So these two amazing Corvette ZR1s epitomize a strong alliance between design and engineering. Our team's effort has created the finest Corvettes in our industry. And what this car represents is a real plan of effort and a combination for what we learned from racing. This is a very serious machine in terms of what it's capable of doing, but also it's a wonderful piece of dynamic art. So I've seen the evolution of the 5th generation, 6th generation, the 7th generation, and now the highlight of the 7th generation, the ZR1. So we're really, really happy and really, really proud we're able to do one and do one that really does justice to the ZR1 name. Uh, it was awesome. It was really fun to uh, introduce this car first in Dubai, uh, and then that, that video was taken from LA. Uh, so it really is uh, a global brand. People really appreciate uh, the Corvette all around the world. A lot of people were scratching their head, why Dubai? Uh, well, the Middle East, there's a lot of rich people there. Uh, it's becoming a bigger and bigger uh, part of our market. Um, it could be much bigger. Uh, the customers there are a lot like you guys, except about 30 years younger. They're, uh, <laughs> some of you 20 years younger. But uh, they're super knowledgeable, super passionate about the brand. Um, they got a lot of disposable income. They typically own a bunch of cars. Uh, but they are really excited about Corvettes. And so uh, you know, we introduced the, the Grand Sport in Geneva. Um, Another part of our global footprint, uh, making an impression on the world uh, with the car. And then in LA, the timing worked out perfect for the North American debut. Uh, you saw Mark Royce, uh, he's head of all product development uh, in General Motors. He's very passionate about Corvette and all performance, uh, including Camaro and D-Series Cadillacs. Very passionate about uh, performance. He actually uh, did this one week after hip surgery. Uh, he was so uh, passionate about getting out there, introducing the car, being part of it. Uh, most people wouldn't even be back to work here. He is flying across the country uh, and almost needed help getting up onto the stage uh, to be part of the reveal. But that's the kind of commitment and passion that he has. So, um, yeah, the ZR1's obviously uh, big news. Um, you saw the, the orange car. We actually have an orange car in here uh, in convertible form. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's been quite a media blitz. Uh, you see the ZR1 everywhere uh, being talked about. Uh, I'll go through some of the, a little more of the details just to make sure everybody's uh, familiar with exactly what's going on here. So the LT5, uh, we use the same RPO, Harlan uh, described that. RPO stands for Regular Production Option. So that's just a code that lets the, the whole manufacturing system know what components need to flow to that vehicle. Uh, so the LT5 engine, 755 horsepower, 715 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, that's just as important as the horsepower number. Broadband horsepower, you, you find it in every uh, part of the, the tack. 212 mile hour top speed, I'm going to show you uh, a video of, of that run uh, that we did in Germany. A dual and fuel injection, so both direct injection, which our other uh, Corvettes have been adding port injection. Uh, at high engine uh, speed and high horsepower. Just to get enough fuel in the engine, we had to add a second system to deliver that fuel. Um, next thing is uh, the transmissions. Um, this is another example where we listened to you guys, uh, the last gen, C6. We did Z06 and Z01 in manual transmission uh, only. And I can't tell you how many people came up to me and said, well, 
I can't buy the Z06, I can't buy the Z01 uh, because my spouse, whoever that might be, um, doesn't really want to drive a stick all the time. We have to have an automatic, so we bought a Grand Sport, but they really would like the extra performance to get that uh, engine in the higher level car. And so uh, we really listened to that and wanted to make sure that this time around, both for Z06 and for ZR1, uh, we offer both transmissions. So the, the seven speed with the rev match, which um, we just had a journalist uh, review. You probably saw a bunch of the media uh, hype around it. We showed the car road Atlanta, and I was amazed. Uh, the journalists usually are super prideful about their driving skill and the ability to do um, uh, heel toe downshifts. Almost all of them just put the rev match on uh, now, so that is becoming uh, kind of pervasive. Everybody kind of expects it, and the performance of that system has gotten better that even pro drivers will use it because you cannot do better uh, than it. Uh, so the standard chassis, uh, as on the last uh, ZR1, we have a magnetic ride, uh, ELSD, which is uh, new for this generation, ceramic brakes, first time on a Corvette and C6, uh, again, standard on the car here. And, um, you know, we have Brembo uh, come to many of our events to talk about the collaboration that we have between uh, General Motors Corvette and, and Brembo. And they're really happy uh, that they partnered with us because we've actually pushed uh, their technology in a direction to make it more everyday useful. Uh, when the C6 ZR1 came out, ceramics were very exotic. Uh, they came only on really high-end cars or expensive options on high-end cars, and they were kind of track-oriented, and so all anybody cared about was track performance. Nobody cared about you know, how easy it to modulate when they're cold, you know, whether they feel like a daily drive when they're cold, uh, do they make noise? A lot of them were really noisy systems back then because you didn't care about that on the track, and we actually pushed Rumble and the technology in the direction to make it uh, everyday useful in addition to uh, the ability to perform really well on the track. The standard car, uh, obviously, are the Michelin tires. The tires are the same uh, sizes as on the, the Z06. Uh, the standard car comes with the lower drag spoiler, so that's the low spoiler. That's actually no higher than the, the uh, Z06 uh, wicker uh, rear spoiler system. We wanted to have uh, you know, hardcore track version, at least reasonably, you know, the best arrow we could, but because the arrow aids have to be directly tied into the body structure, they can't be attached to the hatch like you see on a lot of cars. When you open the hatch, the spoiler goes up with it. There's so much load on that thing, it would actually press the hatch down into the body work, compress the seals, and it would actually change the attitude of the wing, which you cannot have uh, on the track. It would make the car unstable. So we have to tie it directly into the structure, and that means the wing stays in place when you open the hatch or the deck lid uh, on the convertible. And so it's pretty hard if you check the cars out out here. It makes lo loading luggage or the removal roof uh, makes it more difficult to load over that wing. So we want to make sure if somebody wanted all the horsepower chassis and everything uh, on the ZR1, but still want to use it as an everyday car, um, we put the low wing in there to, to be a more all-around easier car to use. So that's the standard condition. And then Harlan mentioned the ZTK, which like 60% of the people, uh, 69, almost 70% of the people are requesting. Um, it certainly makes the car visible from a long way away. You can tell, okay, that's the ZR1. Um, spoilers up nice and high. Uh, that's the best you see it on race cars. The spoilers are high, up in the clean air. Uh, it's nice because it's so high you can't see it in the rear view mirror. Uh, you actually see under it, uh, which is a, a nice feature. So in that way, it's, it's actually better than the low-weight car. Um, you get the cup tires, and um, you get, uh, on the zero one, I, I mentioned the brakes. Uh, we put uh, hybrid racing pads uh, at all four corners, and then we put a uh, special version, even though it looks the same, it's a special version on the front rotors. Um, it actually bakes longer uh, in the oven at Brembo. Uh, these things take like a week to make a set of rotors, a uh, very special process, and it takes even longer uh, if you bake them. It actually puts more silicone in the rotor and that helps with heat resistance and um, that makes the car more robust on the track. I uh, mentioned the engine, a lot of uh, content changes in the engine. Wanted to make sure uh, it didn't only make a lot of horsepower, but it would do so uh, for the life of the car, either on the street or on the track. 
Um, we actually had to, uh, we work with Eaton as we have before. This is one of their biggest uh, superchargers. Very challenging to package it uh, under the hood. We actually had to invent a new throttle body. We found that for the first time that a restriction, you know, it's basically a pump. You're gonna uh, take air through the engine. And we found that even though we were using the biggest uh, throttle body General Motors and our suppliers had, it was still a bit of a restriction. So we had to tool up a new one uh, from scratch. Uh, it's almost 100 millimeters, 95 millimeters in diameter. It's almost four inches around. That's how big this uh, throttle is. Uh, had to do new control systems, uh, redo the lube uh, and vent, that's for uh, oil management, make sure the car lubes itself well uh, on the track. And then uh, we had to do a um, special version of the hood, which you've probably seen out here, to actually surround the engine because it comes up right through the hood. And all the engines will be built right over here uh, in the plant at the Performance Build Center. So all these will be hand built. Here's a little more detail uh, on the supercharger. You can see it's actually uh, three inches, 73 millimeters is three inches taller than the LT4. Uh, also quite a bit taller than the LS9 that we had in the sixth generation car. The reason why height is good is that you can, first of all, the blower itself is bigger, so that takes up more room. But you also have the heat exchangers for the intercooler as you go up, you can make those bigger, which means you're taking more heat out of the intake charge. Cooler air into the cylinders means more power. And then it also improves the flow path. The higher it is, the longer the flow has to get through the, the uh, heat exchangers, mix properly, and go through the ports. If that whole system is set up higher, you can get a more even distribution uh, into all cylinders, which really helps us out. The, uh, when you look at the hood, you know, that's one of the big challenges we had was how do you do this giant engine in a car with a very low seating position and a very low roof? You don't want the engine to obscure all your view forward, so we wanted to keep it as low as possible. You remember on the C6 ZR1, we pushed the engine all the way up to the underside of the hood. We eliminated the inner panel on the hood. We eliminated the hood blanket, and we just put that little uh, polycarbonate window in uh, so that you could see the engine through there. Um, we spent a fortune dressing up the engine. You know, we actually used the cast aluminum uh, intercooler cover, and then we uh, polished it, and we painted it, and we clear coated it to make it look as good as we could. And a lot of people thought it was fake. A lot of people actually thought it was a piece of plastic because it looked so perfect. Um, this time around, we said, well, okay, that wasn't the most successful. We actually need more room, more vertical room. So we said, well, why don't we take the engine right up through the hood? Um, Callaway does that. Uh, you can see the engine. But we didn't want it to have just this sort of crude machinery coming up through the engine or through the hood. So we said, why don't we just do the whole intercooler cover in carbon and then have the carbon hood, which surrounds it, also be carbon. We create a racing stripe uh, look with the ability to have the engine uh, coming right up through. So, a lot of people are really surprised when they look at the car with the hood closed. It looks like what we call our B92 package, which is exposed carbon racing stripe on the hood. But when you open the hood, you can see, no, the hood is just a halo around the engine. And the, this engine cover stays put with the uh, engine and the rest of the hood goes up. So it's kind of a trick uh, solution. It looks really good and it works really well in terms of getting uh, the proper packaging. So the bottom line is, you know, performance, horsepower, torque. I mentioned the numbers. So here's a, a walk-up chart, starting with the LT1. So uh, 460 horsepower, 465 foot-pounds of torque. Certainly no slouch. Uh, it's a hell of an engine, and uh, everybody has one. It's very happy with it. Then we, we brought out the LT4, the Z06. Big step up, uh, supercharged engine. You can see 650 foot-pounds of torque, 650 horsepower. So very, very... Uh, much bigger than the LT1, and in fact, surpassing what we've done on the LS9 in the last generation. And then here's the uh, LT5, and what's important here is to see that the torque curve is everywhere higher. Uh, a lot of times when you go up in power, you end up with a very peaky engine. You get 
uh, the torque curve staying high just right at the end, which pushes the horsepower curve up. And so that's the only place you'll feel it is when you wind it out. That's not the case uh, with this engine. It has a lot more torque across the band. And it doesn't look like a lot here, but if you look at the scale, it actually starts at zero. And each of these increments is 200 foot-pounds, which is an enormous scale. So even though this doesn't look very big, you know, that is like 100 foot-pounds uh, right there, that difference. And that's a difference you can really feel. And the, this engine is so awesome because every gear feels really powerful. There are no bad gears because you pick one, you put hit the throttle and you go. It's just amazing uh, the amount of torque you have on hand. Just for uh, interest, we also put the, what Harlan mentioned. Here's the, the predecessor, LT5. And you can see how far we've come. So the king of the hill uh, back in the 90s, uh, ZR1, that's way down here, way below the standard offering today at 375 horsepower. So you can see how technology has really moved and now uh, we're all the beneficiaries of that. Big uh, important thing on this car was to manage the cooling, make sure that it was uh, cooling well at all temperatures on the track. So that's a big reason the car looks the way it does. The, uh, we crammed as much cooling content in this car as we could. So it has everything from the Z06 plus a bunch of outboard cooling content. So additional heater cooler, each one of these outboard modules that see, you see here has two coolers in it. It has uh, what we call a low temperature. That's actually the inner cooler, uh, cooler. And then additional radiator, so engine coolant cooling. So you actually have three across for both the intercooler and the radiator. Uh, so we spent a lot of time in the wind tunnel making sure that these, the biggest heat exchangers we could package in the car got really good airflow, and so the, the car cools uh, up to 100 degrees now. Full tank of fuel, pro driver, uh, the car will keep cool, whether it's a manual or automatic. This is computational fluid dynamics, and these flow lines are not all the flow lines that go around the car. These are only the flow lines that go through a heat exchanger uh, of one sort or another. So you can see the, the ones in blue uh, go through the center section and they go either under the car or we have the functional hood openings that go over the top of the car, which helps power the rear wing. You can see the new outboard ones, these are in yellow. Uh, they come through the outboard ones. And then these green ones that you see here, those are the flow lines that go all the way to the back of the car and go through the quarter inlets here where we have the uh, trans and dip cooler uh, as we've had on other cars. So the important thing to see is we're not drawing air that cools one component into another. You want fresh, clean air going into all heat exchangers. So that's really important when you're designing the geometry, the, the style of the exterior of the car. You need to make sure each heat exchanger gets perfectly good ambient air. So that's why the front end of this car looks the way it does. Um, you know, this, the, the, what people call the, the bumper cover or the front fascia uh, typically uh, doesn't have this much opening. You can see just from the look of the car that it consists almost entirely of functional openings all the way across. The only part that isn't openings is where we actually have to have the energy absorbing material behind it uh, for the bumper. And we have, still have to meet all the, the bumper or hip requirements. But we've gone so far as to take the structural element behind that uh, bumper energy absorber and we cord it out in multiple locations, uh, actually four big holes, so it actually breathes through the, the bumper structure in addition to uh, around it and below it. It's be stalled out here. Okay, I mentioned the aero, super important. Um, the front, the, the rear wing gets uh, all the attention and when we first introduced this car, uh, we said it had 950 pounds of downforce uh, at top speed and uh, people kind of interpreted that as that the wing does that. The wing is just part of an overall solution. It's the one you can see most visibly, uh, but it's really part of an overall aerodynamic package. Uh, you can see, um, 
on the right here, you can see the underside of the um, underside of the wing above the rear fascia. You can see these flow lines. Uh, that's important because it's actually the underside of the wing that's important. A lot of people think of the top of the wing, you know, it points down, the air kind of bounces off and pushes it down in the car. That's not really the way it works. You get a little bit out of that, but most of it is the air accelerates underneath the wing and that creates low pressure on the bottom of the wing and that is what helps draw the car down. And there's actually a very important feature that you don't really notice unless you look at the car closely, and that's the little spoiler, the little pickout on the rear fascia. That works in conjunction with the wing to actually create uh, what we call a venturi. Uh, a venturi is where air accelerates through a narrow passage, and when air moves fast, that creates low pressure, and so that's what helps uh, that rear wing be so effective. It doesn't do any good to nail the back end of the car and not be able to have downforce on the front of the car. You'll just get a car that understeers. The back end will be planted and the front will wash out. So you have to balance front to rear. And the way we did this was to take uh, a technology and execution right off the race car. If you look at the car from a distance, it looks like we have a conventional splitter, um, the panel that sticks out under the chin. And the way that works is that there's high pressure above it as you're moving through the air. That high pressure acts in all directions and it pushes down on the splitter. Um, that gets you some front down force. Um, but traditionally, we've used flat belly pans uh, underneath that. Uh, it's really good for drag. But what the race team does is they have an upside down wing and the splitter is just the tail of that wing. And then there's a section that looks like an airfoil. Uh, they call it an underwing because uh, that's exactly what it is. And in this picture, red is high pressure. So we're looking at the car upside down. So above the splitter, that's the high pressure that I was talking about. Underneath this whole area of green here, that's low pressure. And so that's the front of the car pulling down and that's what balances uh, with the rear wing to create a car that has uh, very, very good downforce uh, for a street car. Um, I mentioned we were at Road Atlanta last week and we let the journalists drive uh, Rance Ward, Z06s, uh, and ZR1 to kind of move up the performance uh, scale. And they were actually testing uh, our claims. Uh, there's a big sweeping turn that's relatively high speed. And uh, they were trying to see exactly what the speed differential was between a Grand Sport and a ZR1, because it's not a powered corner. You know, engine uh, power does nothing for you. Just It's kind of a constant radius turn. And they were able to go through the same corner 10 miles an hour faster um, in a ZR1 than in a Z06 in transport, all due to arrow because the tires are the same. Uh, so uh, it's a pretty impressive mm -hmm. demo uh, of the capability. So I've gone through, I've talked about uh, a bunch of these um, uh, new content items uh, for the ZR1. This is the most carbon fiber uh, we've ever put on a car. Uh, Corvette actually kind of pioneered the use of carbon fiber on the, the mainstream cars. How, I don't know how many of you remember, we did a special edition right at the end of C5 on the Z06 where we did a carbon fiber hood for the first time. We did 2,000 uh, units and that was our first step into it. Now we have carbon all over the car and we've actually elevated the volume of carbon fiber globally uh, to a much higher benchmark than it had ever been before. So if you walk around the car, you can see uh, a lot of the carbon both on the exterior and on the interior. Uh, this car, of course, gets unique wheels, uh, four finishes, pearl, nickel, carbon flash, satin, graphite, and chrome. Um, I didn't mention it, but the, the one big difference, even though the tires are same, the front wheels are actually a half inch wider, uh, and that's to stiffen the sidewalls of the front. There's a little more weight with all those heat exchangers on the nose of the car. Uh, with the bigger supercharger. The car weighs about 60 pounds uh, more than a Z06. A lot of that weight's on the front. So for steering response, for really crisp turn-in, we wanted to stiffen up the sidewalls, and we did that just by taking the wheel width out a half an inch. This is actually a picture of the clays. This is, you know, you guys can hear from our design folks, Kirk Benyon or Tom Peters. They, they have to do the car you know, in math, in a design space, or in clay, where they sculpt it. Uh, so these are some of the pictures of the final form 
uh, of the car as it was being developed. So that's not a real car. Uh, that's a clay car uh, with what we call Dynock. It's like a foil wrap to give it a body color, typically done in silver. Uh, so here's on the patio at design, um, the final buy-off property for what the car was going to look like. Stalled again. Tell me something. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So here's the rear end view. You can see the uh, the giant rear wing. You can also see we, we thought we might put the badge out on the corner. That's the main difference from what you see in this picture. The ZR1 badge is shown here in the corner. It actually ended up being on the center of the car. Uh, I mentioned the hood and the carbon parts. Here's a picture of the hood. I see that we've got hoods out here open so you can look at it uh, close up. Uh, it was very popular at our, uh, our press event. All the journalists uh, like to go up and stick their head through the hood and get somebody to take their picture, just like a little kids in an amusement park. Um, we have uh, the rear quarter inlet duct is carbon. Uh, the wings, whether they're low or high, are carbon, I've been asked. Um, how heavy is that thing? You need two people to, if you want to take that wing off or replace the high with the low, which we do not recommend. The car is perfectly balanced as we ship it uh, from the plant. Uh, but these things are incredibly light. You can hold the big wing up with one hand. It's hollow, uh, total carbon construction all the way through the wing and the end plates. Uh, it's built just like a race car, except it's beautiful. Um, that's an example of where uh, if you ask a, a an engineer, a pure engineer, to design a wing for you. It looks a lot like a, a two by eight. It's dead straight, has a constant <laughs> section of optimal um, wing airfoil shape, and it looks boring as hell. Um, so the rest of the car is pretty exciting, um, and we want to do more than just have a functional wing. We also want to have a beautiful wing. And so this is an example of where design and engineering work really close together with the race team uh, to try to create a wing that has 100% of the functionality that it needs, but also has a design language that matches the rest of the car. All over, everywhere you look, carbon fiber. Uh, this picture shows the difference between the low wing and the high wing, if you look at the back of the car shows the difference in height and we've got cars out here you can see they're they're quite different interior um car comes two ways so if you want to be super hardcore all you care about is track work <coughs> you can still get a one zr uh, standard car or you can get it all loaded up three zr comes in all interior colors uh, has a specific interior plaque um, model IDs all over, cluster IDs. Um, when you get the 3ZR, you get a carbon fiber uh, wheel rim. We've used accents of carbon before. Now we have big areas of carbon, top and bottom, and the grip portions are uh, either in leather or suede. Uh, it's a really nice steering wheel. Uh, one thing I've noticed that's really cool about it is that the carbon fiber is 100% cleanable. So if you think your hands have some lotion or something on it, you can actually grip the wheel in the carbon areas. There's lots of places you can grip it, and you don't have to worry about getting lotion in your suede or on your leather. I never thought of that as being a reason to have this, but it, actually driving down here for a long drive, it's like, it's pretty nice. I can grab it here, and I don't have to worry about getting my suede messed up. Sebring Orange, we've got a car back here in this uh, Sebring Orange design package. Uh, Harlan talked about it, uh, a lot of requests for orange uh, over the years, and so we uh, did a special version for this car. It includes that Sebring orange paint, uh, black badges, uh, orange paint stripes on the carbon, uh, rockers and splitters, so it uses the same rockers and splitters, but what we do is we mask and paint the orange first, and then we clear coat the whole thing, so it's not decals, it's painted under the clear coat, which is the best and most expensive uh, way to do it. So I was always thinking that uh, clear coated carbon was the most expensive construction you could ever imagine. Well, our designers are hard at work thinking of more expensive ways to do it. And so putting, you know, to, you know, accent stripes on car clear coated carbon pieces is the solution to that problem. Uh, or oh, comes with orange seat belts, uh, brake calipers that match the accent stripes, carbon flash wheels. You can get the wood uh, graphics. Um, and the black 
I'll put the graphic, you can't see on the convertible, but on the coupe you can see extends the black graphic all the way from the windshield to the back window. Special floor mats, uh, these are pretty nice looking floor, floor mats. And then a bronze interior aluminum trim that um, isn't the plain brushed aluminum, it gives it a little warmer, uh, a little slightly towards orange uh, tint, it's bronze. And you get it on all the accent pieces in the interior of the car, as well as the backs of the seats. The whole back of the seat is that color. So it's, it's kind of a nice whole package that goes well together. There's a picture of the interior. You can't really see the backs of the seats. Uh, but we have cars out here that you can check out. Okay, pricing. We've announced the pricing a long time ago. 120 basically, and Harlan's going to change it to uh, one. 19, 995, 50. <laughs> with an additional 50 cents. Yeah, we, we've got to fund our retirement somehow. Somehow, yeah. Um, 3ZR, you see, is uh, 130. So these are expensive, and I've had people come up to me and say, you know, why are you pricing it so much more than the ZR1 before? Well, actually, if you take the rate of inflation, which has been between 2 and 3 percent since 2008, it's exactly the same price uh, as it was uh, when we introduced the C6 uh, CR1. Uh, CDK running 70%. We're probably not charging enough for it. Only $3,000, so maybe we should up the price on that one. So that's why it's really good to come to these events and hear you guys advocating for more expensive packages. Um, and then I, I mentioned the, the Seabring Orange. That's ZLZ. Uh, that's 7000 includes all the content uh, I went through. And as, you know, like the last time, um, when you buy a ZR1, you don't just get a coupon for a discount to the Ron Fellows Driving School, you get the whole driving school paid for. So anybody who buys one should definitely take advantage of that. It's a fantastic experience. Speed limited. 
Um, so there's a governor on it at 215. Um, and I suspect somebody will find a workaround in the aftermarket. The reason we, uh, we limit it to that is because we haven't done tire testing. When we did our early predictions on how fast this car would go, we didn't think it would go this fast, to be perfectly honest. Um, so Michelin hasn't, we don't want to have them spend the resources to go do a bunch of tire testing, which is pretty elaborate, but you can imagine running a, a tire for extended velocity at um, you know, 220 or 225, whatever you decide you want the limit to be. So uh, we decide, well, you know, anything over 215, that's crazy. You know, we'll just, 215 <laughs> should be fine. Um, so you've seen a lot, you know, this car obviously is a, a media darling in many ways. Uh, covers of many magazines, uh, lots of people uh, talking about it. Um, we had an interesting situation uh, occur in January, so you notice the date on here, January 25th uh, of this year. Uh, you don't hear us talking about the competitors very often, um, but in this case, the Ford uh, GT uh, was taken to VIR, uh, where lightning lap is conducted by a uh, car and driver uh, every year. Uh, car and driver finally got their hands uh, on a Ford GT to do a real world test, and they managed to get it on the track uh, at VIR. And they broke their uh, personal track record with uh, Porsche 918. I don't know if everybody knows what that is, but that's like a million dollar supercar. That car is so expensive, you get a Porsche Turbo for free when you buy it, in addition to the 918. <laughs> So it's a super expensive car, and it held the record uh, at VIR for a long time in car drivers' hands. Um, they took the GT there and, uh, and broke that record uh, with a 243 uh, lap time. So they were talking about how fantastic this car is, unbelievable. And then a, they put a pro driver uh, in it, and it says in a recent run for VIR, the Ford GT destroyed other times to become the new record holder with a 238.6 lap so far uh, superior to what the, the writers at Car and Driver were able to And their car's only half a million instead of a full million. Yeah, that's only a half a million if you, if you can get on the list. Um, so that actually came out of a tweet uh, from the driver saying, I did 238.6, I've lowered the track record. Uh, so that was on the 25th of January. Uh, unfortunately for them, on... <laughs> doing our uh, durability testing. Um, not intending to go run fast laps or anything. We, we actually went there because we've talked about it here a lot. We do 24 hours at race speed to do a final validation. So we take a car with all our production calibrations, we take it to a track, and we accumulate 24 hours uh, as nonstop as we can. So drivers need brakes, you have to replace tires, you have to fill with gas. Um, you have to do all the regular maintenance things, but we want to make sure uh, nothing breaks because this represents uh, a lifetime of track uh, usage. So it's a big undertaking, a huge deal for us. And because of the launch timing of this car, we weren't able to do it where we usually do it in Michigan at our own course. So we had to rent VIR uh, to do it. And so we were running a variety of course setups uh, there. And um, we accidentally broke the record. <laughs> it just happened. Um, so yeah, Jim Merrill was out uh, doing some of this validation. We ran the same course that they ran on, and we ran 237.5. So six days later, we broke their record by 1.4 seconds. And so they had the shortest lived uh, record <laughs> in history. And that's kind of kept going. Almost everywhere we've taken the car, it somehow or other uh, broke a track record. So it was funny because um, I was told by GM Communications that we got a call from Ford to their counterparts at Ford saying, nice job, you guys couldn't have planned that any better, you couldn't have done it any better, congratulations. And we were like, we didn't plan it, we just happened to be there doing testing, sorry. Um, our car totally stopped because we were validating it, uh, completely stopped. So it's it's kind of uh, a testament to how, how good this car really is. Okay, next slide. So I'm going to show you the video of that one. This is the actual PDR video. This is something that's been made by a professional group.
one of the things we really tried to do, and I didn't know if the journalists would appreciate it given the short window of time they had to drive the car on the street and track, we really tried to not just make it a scary fast car, not just throw a bunch of horsepower at it, and uh, you know, it's just a you know, Z06, but higher level. We really wanted to make the edges of the performance on envelope uh, more accessible to more people. So make the car more benign, easier to drive, more confidence inspiring so you can get closer uh, to those limits so that a lot of people uh, will be able to experience its performance. And if you read through the media, you see a lot of that really came through. Uh, they actually appreciated our efforts in that area and I think makes it not just a 755 horsepower car, but a car that people can get in and use and take right up, right up to the limit uh, and enjoy it. So here's uh, Mike Sutton. Uh, he, he was uh, down there. He said, the mightiest of C7 Corvettes shines brightest at the edge of its performance envelope. That's exactly what he was talking about. Is you can get all the way out there going crazy fast and still feel like you're uh, very, very uh, comfortable. Um, let's see. And uh, the other thing we, we emphasize is this is, like all the Corvettes we've done, they're well-rounded cars. It's not like it's a pure track machine with the stripped out acoustics and super hard chassis, something that's impossible to live with every day. It's still a well-rounded car. and. Uh, it says down here, traction lies with relative ease with, with drivers of all sorts can tap into its massive potential with no compromise to its entertainment or livability. So that's not quite true. I was talking about the high wing, getting stuff over the high wing. That's a compromise to livability, so I don't want to fool anybody. But in terms of the driving experience, uh, it really is an uh, all-around touring car and daily driver uh, like you've experienced on other Corvettes. Uh, this was a young guy uh, from Auto Week. He says, uh, new king of this breaks all the laws of physics. Uh, it reads like theory, but after driving the 755 horsepower 2019 CR1, I now know time travel is possible. <laughs> so, you, for 120 grand, you get a time machine. That's pretty good. Nobody, nobody thought we'd be able to do a time machine for $120,000. Changes of direction are instantaneous. Um, he really appreciated the, uh, what we've done with the exhaust, so there's actually more difference between when it's quiet and when it's loud, and it's not all of a sudden quiet and loud, it's more of a smooth transition because we put a, actually a passive valve inside the muffler that slowly cracks open as you press the throttle, so it's not all or nothing, um, so they really appreciated that. Uh, he says um, it's quiet in tour mode, not relatively quiet, quiet. I don't know what he's been driving, but it's still a Corvette. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a Cadillac, like, it's not super quiet, but he really appreciated the difference between uh, you know, how expressive the exhaust could be and how quiet it could be. Road and track. Uh, how quick is the ultimate Corvette? Really damn quick. Um, Matt Farah wrote this. Um, he came to track. He's quite a good driver. Uh, he spent a lot of time uh, in the car, and I was standing right by the track. Um, and I don't, this is Road to Atlanta. How many people have been to Road to Atlanta? I'm just curious. So you guys know it's not for the mile apart. It's it's a kind of old school uh, racetrack. Uh, there's real risk uh, there. It's a real roller coaster. There's a lot of blind corners. Um, so it's not a place to go and take a high, you know, supercar or hypercar and learn the track uh, for the first time. Um, Matt had been there before. Uh, he, he was really eager to get in this car. And I was standing there when he first exited the car. He'd been out for a few laps, he came out, and he just stood there. He had a big grin on his face, and he said, more car than balls. <laughs> that, was, that was his summation of his experience uh, on the track. Uh, but he went on, you know, he, he wrote a, a long uh, article. Um, he, he says the same thing. The ride, more than anything, impressed me on the road drive. ZR1 is a car that front approach angles aside, I can live with every day. So it's similar uh, to other Corvettes. They're low, um, so don't drive them when there's more than, you know, six or eight inches of snow. Um, we had to do that all winter. We did our capture test fleet um, this winter, just because of when the car was being introduced. 
we got our cars in the fall and got to ride all winter uh, in these things. We put uh, Michelin snow tires, which are available now in our sizes. And uh, actually, it's, it was a riot driving the car all winter. It was no compromise. It was really fun. Um, so he, he references the Ford GT. Uh, as usual for the segment, there's nothing quite like it. Handily embarrassed the $450,000 Ford GT uh, by accident. So for $140,000, so he, he knew about that. Uh, the Sierra One is everything you want out of the ultimate Corvette to compete with the world at a price nobody can compete with. Bottom line, it is without question the fastest, loudest, craziest, most capable Corvette ever made, which puts it right in the running for the fastest road cars of all time. America, hell yeah. <laughs> Andy Pilbrook came. You guys remember Andy, right? Um, great guy. Uh, he was uh, great fun to come with, uh, obviously. Uh, he knows the track, he knows fast cars. Um, so he was really interested in uh, keeping him out there. <laughs> we have winter of all conditions. It was cold the first day, hot the second day. Um, so he was there on a hot day. Uh, he saw 168 uh, miles an hour. I think Randy's time at the end of, I think he was going 172. It was a little cooler uh, the day Randy was there. But Andy was still getting to 168. Anybody who's been to Road Atlanta knows 168. That's fast. Uh, she come uh, over the top of the hill. Pretty scary. Um, so one of the things he did um, was at the end of the day when things were winding down, it was the hottest part of the day. It was about 90 degrees. Uh, we wanted and he wanted uh, to go out and run essentially a tank of fuel. Uh, so we put him in an automatic and uh, actually with all the other journalists watching, he went out and ran a tank of fuel, which I think was about 13 laps. Uh, very consistent lap times, uh, between 130 and 131. So he was uh, not trying to go for a qualifying lap, but trying to run continuous steady laps at a very high pace. Uh, he basically did that uh, with the car. Um, not complaining one bit. Um, you know, there's the Z06's reputation for being less than robust on the track in the heat. Um, this car is validated to 100 degrees here. We put Andy in the car uh, to run as hard as he could uh, for a tank, and the car behaved perfectly. One of the reasons we wanted to do that is the way you run these media events, you got a bunch of people buying for car time, and so we typically let them go out three or four laps, then they got to come in, let somebody else have a turn, and so that starts conspiracy theories that, oh, a car can't go more than three laps uh, before having trouble. So that's that's not it. It's just that we want to get all the journalists through the car and everybody uh, be able to share them. But we thought this time would be a really good idea to let somebody, at least want somebody, somebody everybody respected, uh, that they knew could push a car to its limit, let them go out and run the car hard. Uh, ZR1 never got nervous or twitchy, saw no warning lights. Uh, engine temps remain in the normal range throughout the run. So this this was a completely stock car. Um, like I said, we've done absolutely the best job. We know how to do cram as much content uh, for cooling into this vehicle. Uh, here's top gear, uh, Pat Devereaux um, saying, what is the competition for the ZR1? Frankly, there isn't any uh, at this price. Um, compares it to the McLaren. Um, yeah, he was uh, super happy. So Top Gear hasn't always been a huge fan of American cars, uh, but his bottom line is we should pause for a moment and recognize that America's best supercar for now is the furious Corvette CR1. And uh, he's, you know, he's, he's referencing how much better the C7 is in general. You see, saw that in, in some of the other articles that, um, that the, the CR1 is the pinnacle C7. We get all the C7 goodness and then you just take it uh, to the extreme in the ZR1. Okay, Harlan mentioned big announcements. Did you mention it? Anyway. All right. This is the only reason most of you are still awake. Maybe not that big. <laughs> There's a reason this big announcement is such small print. <laughs> so, our news is we're going to pace Indy. Actually, that's an old, that's right, you guys do that? So, um, do we know who's gonna drive? I 
know there's been a few people practicing. I volunteer. <laughs> okay, who wants Harlan to drive? Check and settle then. That was easy. Uh, and settle me. And settle, yes. Um, Admiral Blue Car, uh, some unique graphics. Um, we like to joke that this is the only pace car in the world that when they drop the flag, it doesn't get off the track, it just accelerates. Away from all race cars and the race. Um, so we're, we're the closest to being able to do that uh, with the Zero One. So here's the really big news. You know how we like to mess with colors. We can't leave them well enough alone. We're always tampering. Um, and so uh, we're going to have a new gray. And we've had a whole series of grays here. Um, but it turns out every time we change them, the penetration goes up. Um, a lot of people are ordering the Zero One. Uh, in the uh, Watkins Glen gray, they think it looks really sinister, but not black. Uh, we actually have samples up here. I think it'll actually improve that sinister I'm look. Gonna, I'm going to say something about the samples. Okay. we got Chuck Valentini here, okay. our expert at paint, or charge and paint, the new paint shop, everything that's going great at Bowling Green. And he said, he goes, huh? he goes you can't just show a couple of paint ch chips at the Corvette Museum with all the most important customers here, that's not good enough. I'm going to bring over some early panels that we painted in the new paint shop. So thanks, Chuck, for doing that. He's my hero. And, uh, <laughs> we're going to take it out and hold it up. You want to bring it up, Chuck? So this, this happened while we were presenting. I didn't know we were doing this. So this came together, I guess, at the last minute. So we have two new colors. Uh, one is a shadow gray, replaces Watkins Glen. And uh, Elkhart Lake Blue replaces Admiral Blue. And this breaks my heart, to tell you the truth, because Admiral Blue has been one of my all-time favorites. I've actually been pushing for it to come back. I loved it in the fourth generation car. And, um, but we're going to tamper with it um, and give people something new to talk about. So Harlan's holding the gray. Actually, the uh, round of applause really should go to Chuck and the team who brought the paint show. I can't tell you the number of people who've come up to me who bought recent cars out of the new shop and they say it's the best looking car they've ever seen from a paint perspective. Absolutely world class. It embarrasses a lot of expensive cars. Uh, it's parked next to and uh, you know, that was a huge investment over there, a huge project to get that uh, paint shop in place. <laughs> okay, we're taking him out of the pace car. He's going to take an auto show model instead. Anyway, we'll let you uh, come up and take a look at these. Um, I think that's actually the end of the show. Oh, yeah, I wanted to mention the... Uh, the last day to order, if you say, oh my god, I can't stand those new colors, I've got to have one of the old colors. Um, well, obviously it's too late, for, for the ZR1 anyway. Um, but the last day to order on the rest of the cars, uh, the current uh, Watkins gray is May uh, 17th, and uh, we'll be producing the car, new color August 6th. And then for the blue, last day to order June 28th, and uh, we'll start production October 1st, so a little more time on the blue. So, thank you, Chuck. I appreciate the teamwork and willingness to go the extra mile to bring us some panels. We can put these outside in the sun. People can take a look at them. Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay. I think that uh, wraps up.